<clears throat> so I think that everyone sees the. So the only thing that they see is the slides. The slide okay. Right now. Mm -hmm. So. So my name is Angeles Lopez Olivo, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of General Internal Medicine in the Rheumatology section. And in this webinar, I'm going to cover how to report systematic review results. So the lecture is divided into three segments. How to structure the results section of a systematic review, the recommendations for reporting a systematic review, and how to evaluate the risk of bias in systematic reviews. Um, that is for internal validity, what we normally know as methodological quality. So let's go to the next one. How do you with the arrows? Is it uh, how do I go to the go to your next like yeah, this? Right there. Yeah, okay. Great. So systematic reviews nowadays are very popular. In fact, over the past thirty years the number of systematic reviews published has increased exponentially. A search in PubMed, a medical search engine for the term systematic review, as a free text and filtered by date and article types, um, same systematic review categories, found that from 1956 to 1985 there were over a thousand citations categorized as systematic reviews. And from 2006 to 2015 this number increased to more than 100,000. So in the, the, this this is because um, the number um, of systematic reviews is so large because they can limit bias by using both published and unpublished research, which minimizes a publication bias. They can also enhance methodological rigor by holding reviewers to high scientific standards where a systematic approaches follow for study selection, data collection, study evaluation, and analysis. They can also employ better and more appropriate statistical tools for the analysis of multiple studies. Sometimes systematic reviews generate, uh, generate new questions. For example, <clears throat> a pool analysis of several studies can reveal an important finding that was not evident in the individual studies. They also can identify gaps in the existing literature, and they can identify deficiencies in completed studies to reduce the waste of resources in research by avoiding recurring patients into uh, unneeded studies that are unlikely to help answer important questions. However, with the exponential increase in systematic reviews and meta-analysis production, there are many concerns about the quality, the, the quality of these systematic reviews. So, uh, the Institute of Medicine has issued standards designed to increase objectivity, minimize bias, improve reproducibility, and improve also reporting. These standards apply to different um, types of reviews, um, such as intervention reviews and, and other types of reviews. And these standards also exist for reviews that synthesize evidence from different type of studies. And, and now we're going to see an example of why it's important to follow this type of um, standards or guidelines. So, Depression affects more than 14 million adults in America, um, and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are a class of drugs used as antidepressants. As with any other medications, uh, multiple side effects have been reported with um, this type of uh, inhibitors. Suicide behavior has been also reported, but with different risk rates. Because of this, uh, many have asked if people taking these agents have uh, increased risk of suicidal behavior. So one study, which is a review of systematic reviews published in 2014, was conducted to answer this question. The study included 12 systematic reviews with different results, and the authors wanted to summarize the results and also assess the quality of the studies and explain the differences in the results. They used an 11-item instrument. They found that results were influenced by quality. And as you can see here, studies with lower quality tend to report no association whereas the studies with higher quality reported a strong association of this type of medications and suicide behavior. So this study demonstrated the importance of improving the quality of systematic reviews. Higher quality could be achieved by following these methodological standards that we talked about. So, <clears throat> although there are some variation between the standards recommended by different organizations, there are common steps used for systematic reviews. And this can be summarized in five steps. First, we have to select a topic. 
then we locate and select studies that are relevant to the particular topic that we're looking um, to answer. Uh, once we have all the studies that can answer a research question, we create a data collection form to appraise the quality of each individual study and extract the results. When results for all relevant outcomes to answer our question have been extracted, then we synthesize this information. And finally, our findings are prepared in a report that could be updated when new evidence becomes available. So this webinar will cover the main aspects of this last step. So <clears throat> what is the best way to present the results? To answer this question, we first have to identify the type of synthesis that we are, uh, we are going to be reporting. By the end of this lecture, we will be able to list what are the most common approaches to synthesize the evidence and to identify the issues that we may encounter when reporting the results. So now let's talk about how to analyze the data once it has been collected. There are two ways in which data can be summarized in a qualitative or narrative manner, and with a quantitative approach to combine results of multiple studies to exponentially increase the power and improve precision. Narrative synthesis is the textual organization, description, exploration, and interpretation of study findings and the attempt to find explanations for those findings without a mathematical combination of numbers. On the contrary, meta-analysis is the mathematical combination of effect sizes across studies to obtain an overall effect size. This means that out of multiple reports of studies with contrasting results, we can provide one estimate indicating how big the effect is and if it is significant or not. And, and in addition, we can also identify what characteristics of the studies are contributing to the variations in the results. Uh, narrative synthesis is sometimes viewed as a second best approach for the synthesis of findings from multiple studies. It's only to be used when a statistical meta-analysis or another specialist uh, form of synthesis like a meta-synthesis for qualitative studies is not feasible. So usually we conduct a narrative synthesis when the characteristics of the included studies are so different that a meta-analysis could lead us to provide an imprecise estimate or when we don't have at least two studies reporting on the same outcome or in, an, in any situation when there is lack of data to calculate effect sizes or performing the meta-analysis uh, could potentially cause underrepresentation of the body of evidence. After completing our systematic review, findings are organized and described per groups or themes and then findings are synthesized and interpreted in a table. So narrative synthesis is a form of storytelling and telling a trustworthy story is extremely important. That is why a main principle with this type of synthesis is to be transparent. It is also important to make use of the best available evidence and that only studies with similar outcomes are combined and for this there are four elements that have been proposed to a narrative synthesis process. Developing a theory of how the intervention works, why and for whom, and this is to inform decisions about the review questions and what types of studies to review. Developing a preliminary synthesis of findings of the included studies and this is to organize findings from included studies to describe patterns across the studies in terms of the direction of effects and the size of effects. Um, the other uh, element or the third element is exploring relationships in the data to consider the factors that might explain any differences in direction and size of effect across the included studies. And finally, uh, or the fourth step is assessing the robustness uh, of the synthesis to provide an assessment of the strength of the evidence and um, also provide an estimate of how confident we are about the results. And the last part is our interpretation of the results that should be based on the data that um, we have synthesized under this 
four elements. So these types of reviews can help to demonstrate the importance of the context in which interventions are used. Uh, that is what works, why, for whom, and when, and also examine how results can be affected by contextual or temporal variables. And they also can identify gaps in current research and present opportunities for the development and testing of interventions, outcome measures, and potential moderators in clinical trials. So it is important to always follow the guidelines for conducting this type of synthesis, given that transparency can be easily compromised. Many issues can arise while synthesizing the evidence in a qualitative manner. For example, poor tabulation of data and data visualization methods can lead to conclusions with caveats. And the final product can be very lengthy if synthesis is not appropriate. Uh, finally, uh, if we included diverse study designs. The synthesis can be difficult as uh, well as the assessment of the strength of the evidence. So the four elements that uh, need to be included in this type of synthesis um, are the ones that we already explained, and they are detailed in the guidance of the conduct of narrative synthesis and systematic reviews um, that was developed by Popeye and collaborators. And you can see the reference in this slide. So <clears throat> the first thing is the preliminary synthesis. So the purpose of the preliminary synthesis is to develop an initial description of the results of included studies. Um, it is important to remember that the product of this initial process will only be preliminary rather than an end or, or a final product in itself. It will always be necessary to interrogate the preliminary synthesis to identify factors that have influenced the results reported in included studies. That is to begin to construct an explanation of how and why a particular intervention has the effects reported of um, how and why particular factors uh, or processes on implementation uh, work on implementation and also to test the robustness of the results of the synthesis. So this is the purpose of other elements on the synthesis process um, during the preliminary synthesis, reviewers focusing on the effects of an intervention will need to organize the results of the included studies so they are able to describe the patterns across them in terms of both the direction and size of effects reported. And you can see here um, all the, uh, in the first column all the information that is uh, needed so we can compare the studies. Um, and in relation to review, uh, to a review on implementation, these studies need to be organized so that patterns in the factors that are reported as impacting in some way on the implementation of an intervention can be identified across the studies. So in the second column, you can see how the findings have to be summarized in uh, what is the direction of the effect, what is the size of the effect, and is the effect uh, consistent across studies, and also, finally, the strength of the evidence. So. There are several tools and techniques that have been described to help synthesize qualitatively the evidence. Many of these specific tools and techniques described um, in here involve visual representation, and this can be invaluable in, at all stages of the synthesis, uh, even for qualitative uh, uh, synthesis. But it is important to recognize that visual representation of data is not sufficient uh, in itself as synthesis. Tabulation and other visual representations of data tend to res reduce studies to their key characteristics, neglecting aspects that could be important in understanding the patterns uh, revealed. Therefore, the relationship between the visual representation of the data, that is the descriptive synthesis, and the narrative elaboration of the pattern identified, that means the interpretative synthesis, is critical to the quality of the narrative synthesis. So let's start with textual descriptions, which is what you first see here. A simple starting point in a preliminary synthesis is to produce just a descriptive paragraph on each included study. 
It may also be useful for recording purposes to do this for all excluded studies as well. So you know the differences between studies. This sensitizes the reviewers to the context of each study, highlighting and extracting main features, but maintains the study as a whole and also in context. The next step is to group the studies. Um, <clears throat> organizing the included studies into groups can also be very useful um, to, to help in the process of description and analysis and looking for patterns within and across the groups. It is important to use the review question to inform decisions about how to group the included studies. So studies can be grouped according to one or um, several combinations of, of uh, this. Uh, of, uh, of these categories, um, the type of intervention being study or the setting or context for the intervention. For example, if we are studying things at a, a school uh, or a community, uh, a clinic or an emergency room, um, <clears throat> the group at whom it is being directed, if we are studying uh, uh, groups um, of different ages, for example, the study design. Uh, randomized control trials, observational case reports, etc., and the nature of the results being reported. If uh, we have different outcome measures, we can group also the studies by the type of outcome, uh, for or, or different type of factors that impact the results. Um, so tabulation is uh, uh, another uh, step on the narrative synthesis, and it's a common approach used in all types of systematic reviews, not only um, narrative but also qualitative. Uh, 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 systematic reviews because they can help to uh, display the data visually. So typically it's used to provide details of study design, results of study quality assessment, outcome measures, and other results. And um, this data may be presented in different columns in the same table or in different tables. And that is normally what you see in ta first table of a systematic review and second table which is uh, study characteristics and participant characteristics. Uh, so transforming data is the next step, or also translating data. But transforming data means to construct a common rubric across the quantitative um, studies. So we allow the, 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 the people that are reviewing uh, to develop a sort of like a summary of uh, study results and a more robust assessment of the range of effects that would be anticipated for a particular uh, intervention. Where studies involve both qualitative and quantitative data, uh, also the authors or reviewers may decide to construct a common rubric for the synthesis. And this could involve transforming the qualitative findings into quantitative form or also vice versa. Um, but, um, <clears throat> The other way to, to do it is to translate the data. So uh, thematic analysis and content analysis can help in this process in translating or in reinterpreting the information that um, the studies are providing uh, and, and sometimes is referred as uh, translation of the data. So here is an example of an abstract summarizing the results qualitatively. And you can see in the um, results that there is no actually numbers provided. There is only information summarized in a, in a qualitative form. And that, that's how you can identify something that has been, that, that, that couldn't actually uh, include um, data or raw data from individual studies. Um, or that it didn't, the studies didn't have enough um, data from the same outcome so they can be pulled or combined. So let's uh, see finally another example of a narrative synthesis approach uh, which is an effective uh, direction table or plot. Um, there are several methods uh, currently used for smoking cessation and um, this table is summarizing uh, information about um, one intervention of smoking cessation. There are many behavioral approaches included um, uh, one that it's called stage-based intervention in smoking cessation. Um, the stage-based intervention separates individuals into different stages, uh, pre-contemplation, contemplation, 
preparation, action, and maintenance. Uh, progression through the stages is sequential, and although relapse to an early stage can occur, stage-based models propose that interventions that take into account the current stage of the individual will be more effective and efficient than one intervention that fits all. So in this example of this table, we see the differences in cessation rate with interventions aimed at smoking cessation. Here we observe which studies reported significant as you can see in the columns, uh, mixed or non-significant results after a stage-based intervention. So the table is showing only three studies. Uh, however, in the original study, there were 26. The number at the top row indicates the number of included studies reporting either one of three types of results. There were eight studies reporting significant differences in cessation rates in favor of the stage-based interventions. There were more studies reporting no differences after the intervention. So this is another way to summarize the information from um, narrative synthesis, when you don't have enough data to pull the data or combine the data mathematically. So <clears throat> before going over the synthesis of quantitative data, let's review again these, major con these two major concepts as you hear, that you see here in this slide. A systematic review is the application of scientific strategies that limit bias to the systematic assembly, critical appraisal, and synthesis of all relevant studies on a specific topic. Not all the systematic reviews include a meta-analysis. Because sometimes, as I've been repeatedly uh, saying, there is no sufficient data to pull or combine the results of these studies. So although you can have many studies, they don't have information on the same outcome, so you can combine mathematically the data on one outcome. Meta-analysis, on, on the contrary, or not the contrary, but meta-analysis is a different concept, which is just a mathematical approach to combine and summarize the results of several studies reporting data on the same outcome. So it is just a mathematical approach. Let's first uh, learn a little bit of history before going on to the qualitative synthesis. So in 1904, Carl Person reported use of formal techniques that previously were presented by an astronomer called George Biddle to combine data from different samples. His work about effect of serum inoculations against enteric fever combined observations from different clinical studies. He was asked to analyze data comparing infection and mortality among soldiers who had volunteered for inoculation against typhoid fever in various places across the British Empire. Um, with, and he wanted to compare that with, others, uh, with that of other soldiers who had not volunteered. So that was the first uh, attempt to do some sort of meta-analysis. Then during the 1930s, another British statistician, uh, his name Ronald Fisher, encouraged scientists to summarize their research in, in a way to make the comparison and combination of estimates almost automatic. And the same as if all the data were available. So Fisher's influence on meta-analysis is uh, very important. Uh, he was um, uh, the, one of the ones uh, uh, warning about preferential publication of studies based on statistical significant, significance, um, that is, uh, positive results are you know, most frequently published, and uh, he, he is one of the ones that uh, uh, actually stimulated uh, more research on this area. Uh, and finally, in 1976, Glass coined the term meta-analysis to refer to the statistical analysis. <clears throat> so as we said, a statistical analysis refers a, uh, to a large, uh, I'm sorry, meta-analysis is a statistical analysis uh, referring to summarize of a large collection of analysis, um, a, 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 a summarizing, I'm sorry, a large collection of data uh, of different studies. And this method has become very popular in the, in these uh, uh, years. So, <clears throat> 
we use meta-analysis with the purpose of increasing power to detect an overall treatment effect. And this involves estimation of the degree of benefit associated with a particular study treatment and uh, the assessment of the amount of variability, and which we also call heterogeneity between studies or settled controversies arising from conflict um, claims. And finally, the identification of study characteristics associated with particularly uh, with, with a particularly effective treatment. So meta-analysis should not be performed when studies are clinically diverse to avoid comparing apples with oranges. Or if bias is present in each or some of the individual studies, um, because performing a meta-analysis will simply compound the errors and produce a wrong result uh, <clears throat> that may be interpreted as having more credibility. It is important to be familiar with the type of data that, that is a dichotomous or continuous that results from measurement of an outcome in an individual study and to choose the suitable effect measure for comparing the intervention groups. So the contrast between the outcomes of two groups treated differently is not known as the effect or the treatment effect or the intervention effect. And most meta-analysis methods are variation on a weighted average of the effect estimates from the different studies. So <laughs> In summary, meta-analysis answers what is the direction of the effect, what is the size of the effect, and is the effect consistent across studies. And what does a meta-analysis entail? Well, before you know, we start, uh, we have to consider which comparison should be made, which studies results should be used in each comparison, and what is the best summary of, of effect for each comparison. And uh, <clears throat> we can see that and, and um, meta-analysis depicted by a point estimate and a 95% confidence interval. And also, um, we answer the question, are the results of studies similar within each, co each comparison? In a meta-analysis, we also see this depicted um, as the statistical test for heterogeneity, and it, it also includes a p-value. And the other question that we answer is, how reliable are those summaries? So. <clears throat> In, in a meta-analysis, this is depicted by sensitivity or subgroup analysis and investigation of publication bias. So all this is what you will see in a meta-analysis or qualitative synthesis. Uh, <clears throat> then we have um, the forest plot, which uh, you can see here. So the most uh, results of meta-analysis are commonly presented using forest plots. And these graphical representations show the information from the individual studies that were into meta-analysis. And they show the amount of variation between the studies and the estimate of their overall results. With this picture, you can see why they are called forest plots. If we were um, <clears throat> to rotate 90 degrees to the right, um, this picture, we can see how the plots resemble the trees in the picture. And this is an example of a quantitative analysis. Now here in the results section, you can see numbers. So you can so see the combined estimate. Um, <clears throat> now uh, let's talk about our question. Let's continue with what is the best way to present our results. So there are standards to report the results of systematic reviews, and this section will cover that. And this is helpful not only to present your own results, but this is also helpful when you are going through the peer review process. If uh, you have been asked to review a systematic review, uh, you can also check that the report includes all the items that we will dis uh, discuss here. So, <clears throat> At the end of this section, we will be able to summarize the methods for reporting and also to uh, updating the systematic reviews and explain the PRISMA statement. An evidence table is a key tool in the presentation of evidence and also the corresponding results of this evidence. So evidence tables are a method for presenting the quality of the available evidence, the judgments that bear on the quality rating, and the effects of alternative management strategies on the outcomes of interest. The summary of findings tables provide a summary of findings for each of the included outcomes 
and the quality of evidence rating for each outcome in a very accessible format without the, um, the details of the judgments about the quality of evidence. Summary findings tables provide a concise summary of the key information that is needed by someone making a decision and in context of a guideline, uh, which pro, uh, it, in, a, in, I'm sorry, in the context of a guidance, it can provide a summary of the key information that underlines the recommendation. So as you can see, this is the, the most friendly way to, to provide the results of your systematic, the, of your meta-analysis or, or um, the systematic review. So the standard format of the summary findings table includes a list of outcomes, um, the assumed risk, which is a measure of the typical burden of the outcomes, um, that is the illustrative risk of also called baseline risk, uh, or the control group risk, and then the corresponding risk, which is a measure of the burden of the outcome after the intervention is applied. And it is the risk of an outcome in the treated people based on the relative magnitude of an effect and the assume or baseline risk or the control risk. Um, so the relative effect is also presented and for dichotomous outcomes, um, this is a, the relative measure, uh, will provide um, risk ratio, odds ratio or hazard ratio. And um, the number of participants and the number of studies is also provided and their design. Um, and we also present the rating of the overall quality of evidence for each outcome, which it's, it could be different from each outcome. And we provide footnotes or explanations where we can also give the absolute treatment benefit or um, the, the risk difference, etc. Uh, even the number needed to treat can be in this section. So <clears throat> the GRADE approach is a system for writing the quality of a body of evidence in systematic reviews and other evidence synthesis. Um, even for guidelines, it is used uh, and it helps to create the recommendations uh, in general in healthcare. So GRADE offers a transparent and a structured process for developing and presenting the evidence summaries and for carrying out steps involving developing the recommendations. So as you remember, in the previous slide, we saw the summary findings table that includes also the, the quality of the evidence. So when we, when we use GRADE, we help to create, to, to create information for this column. Um, so GRADE is a working group that has developed a public and also a free of charge, uh, easy to, uh, a very easy to use tool for summarizing and presenting the information um, for healthcare decisions um, that support creating concise uh, summary tables for, the system, for systematic reviews. And also it can facilitate the development of clinical practice guidelines and other documents. And this makes recommendations um, for public health or for health policy decisions um, easier. So GRADE uh, also provides a specific definition of the quality of evidence in the context of summarizing the findings of a systematic review. Um, the quality of evidence reflects the extent to which we are confident that an estimate of the effect is correct. So basically we're saying, so this is the confidence that we have in our results. And it can be uh, downloaded according to several things, but um, the quality of the evidence is rated for each outcome across study. Um, so it's important to remember this is for the quality of evidence is given for each outcome, not, uh, not for the overall results of the, of the study, but for every outcome that we are giving. So, so, for example, let's say the quality of evidence may differ from one outcome to another within a single study in a, in a series of unblinded randomized control trial measuring both the occurrence of a stroke and all-cause mortality. It's, uh, if we were measuring these two uh, outcomes, it is possible that the stroke which is much more vulnerable, uh, vulnerable, I'm sorry, to bias judgment, will be rated down for risk of bias. Uh, well, mortality or all-cause mortality may, may not. 
So similarly in a series of studies in which very few patients are lost to follow up for the outcome of death and very many for the outcome of quality of life is likely to result in judgment of lower quality for the for the quality of life outcome. So then we have also, we can have problems with indirectness that may lead to rating down the quality for one outcome and not for another. Uh, for example, fracture rates are measured using a surrogate, uh, which is the bone mineral density, but side effects are measured directly. So these things are taken into account when rating the evidence. So the factors that can reduce the quality of evidence include what we have listed here. So limitations in the study design and execution may bias the estimate of the treatment effect. For example, in randomized controlled trials, lack of allocation concealment, lack of blinding, incomplete accounting of patients and outcome events, and selecting outcome reporting can, can, can downgrade the evidence um, that's pertaining to risk of bias. And then <clears throat> inconsistency of result, that is um, the unexplained heterogeneity of results. For example, if we have a wide variance of point estimates across studies, a minimal or not overlap of confidence intervals, that can downgrade the quality of the evidence. And if we have indirectness of evidence, so as we said before, direct evidence consists of research that directly compares the intervention which we are interested in, um, delivered to populations in which we are interested, and measures the outcome that are important or the outcomes that are important to patients. So results are imprecise when studies include relatively few patients and few events and you know for that reason they have a wide confidence interval around the estimate of the effect. So finally publication bias is a systematic underestimation or an overestimation of the underlying beneficial or harmful effect due to the selective publication of studies. Confidence in the combined estimates of effects from a systematic review can be reduced um, when publication bias is suspected, even when the included studies themselves have a low risk of bias. So here you see a summary of a, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you, you see a summary of findings table and although the quality of the evidence represents a continuum, the great approach that we have discussed uh, results in an assessment of the quality of a body of evidence in four grades. So we can say that the, the quality is high when we are very confident that the true effect lies close to that of the estimate of the effect. So we think that more evidence is unlikely to change the results. And then we say that is moderate quality when we are moderately confident in the effect estimate. So the true effect is likely to be close to the effect estimate or the, true, the, the real estimate of the effect, but there is a possibility that it is, that is, that is substantial different. And uh, we think that more evidence is likely to have an impact in the results. Then when we say that we have low confidence um, or we have low quality in our um, outcome and the results of our outcome, it, that is that our confidence in the effect estimate is limited. The true effect uh, may be substantially different from the estimate of the effect and we think that more evidence is very likely to have an impact in the results. And finally, when we say that there is very low quality, uh, so we have a very little confidence in the effect estimate, the true effect is likely to be substantially different from the estimate of effect and more evidence is needed because we are very uncertain about the results. So once the, um, our manuscript is completed, so we, and we have the summary of findings table or we have the tabulation of our narrative um, synthesis, um, <clears throat> We have to make sure that um, the way that we have reported our systematic review is consistent with the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which is also known as PRISMA. PRISMA is an evidence-based minimum set of items for reporting in systematic reviews and meta-analysis. 
So the PRISMA statement focuses on the reporting of reviews, evaluating randomized controlled trials, but can also be used as basis for reporting systematic reviews of other types of research, particularly evaluations of interventions. And currently, there are several extensions uh, for the PRISMA statement, which is the PRISMA for protocols, and it includes all the items that are needed in the protocols for systematic reviews. And um, <clears throat> we have the, pro the PRISMA IPD, which is the um, PRISMA for systematic reviews on individual patient data. And then we have the PRISMA statement for network meta-analysis, the PRISMA statement for harms, the PRISMA statement for systematic reviews evaluating quant qu equity, and then we have the PRISMA statement for abstracts. When we are submitting abstracts to a conference, it's better to just make sure that we have all the items that are recommended by the, the PRISMA collaboration. So um, also there is a statement that, or a set of recommendations to report systematic review of observational studies. And the PRISMA checklist looks like this. Um, it, it was developed by a group of 21 review authors that included methodologists, clinicians, medical editors, and consumers. And it is in current, uh, currently endorsed by almost all major organizations and most journals required to complete a PRISMA checklist when submitting a systematic review. So the, the PRISMA uh, items, uh, what they do is to focus on ways in which authors can ensure the transparent and complete reporting of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The, the thing is, it does not address directly or in a detailed manner the conduct of systematic reviews. Um, so the PRISMA statement is not for conducting systematic reviews. That Those are the standards that we already mentioned of um, the Institute of Medicine uh, for for the reporting of the systematic review is the PRISMA statement. Um, and there are also other guides available for conducting systematic reviews, like the Cochrane Collaboration, NICE also have their own guidelines, and ARC also have uh, guidelines for conducting systematic reviews. But PRISMA is for reporting systematic reviews. And um, the list of items is presented uh, numerically from 1 to 27, so there are 27 items. Um, but um, the authors don't need to address items in any particular order in the reports. Uh, what is important is that information for each item is given somewhere within the report. And this is um, the last part. As, as you can see, um, they even include information about how to uh, include information in discussion and, um, and, and the parts that um, the results section needs to. To, to, to have. And they also have a flow, uh, flow diagram which needs to be included and um, most journals require this flow diagram when submitting a systematic review. So, <clears throat> so finally there are also guidelines on when is best to update existing systematic reviews because uh, <clears throat> uh, as you can see the amount of uh, systematic reviews that have been published uh, in the last 30 years is increasing and, and it's likely uh, going to increase even more. Uh, so th there, there are ways to know when um, the already existing uh, systematic reviews can help us and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has developed some recommendations with eight areas to be considered. <clears throat> so First, uh, we have to locate uh, the, an existing review, um, a defined and reproducible approach to efficiently identify existing systematic reviews for possible use in conducting a newly proposed systematic review, uh, which includes updates have to be delineated. And then um, we have to assess the relevance, so there, there should be methods by which existing systematic reviews identify in step uh, in, in locating ex ex the existing systematic review or the step, or the step one of, of um, this can be evaluated as to whether there are similar, they, they, the systematic reviews are similar enough to, to the new proposed uh, review to, obe to, to obviate the need for conducting a, a, a new systematic review or, or to obviate several steps of the new systematic review. Um, so that we have to check the relevance um, 
and um, we have to consider how well the existing uh, reviews uh, have answered the research questions that we are interested in, the inclusion and exclusion criteria for uh, population interventions, comparators, outcomes, settings, and also the study design, that they have to match those of the new systematic review that we are proposing and also the literature searches that they have uh, included sim something that is uh, similar to what we are proposing. Uh, use almost relevant systematic review when selecting, developing, or refining questions and providing context for a newly proposed systematic reviews and scan references to, to check new res uh, search results are, are, are very important in this step. And then the next is to assess quality of existing systematic reviews and there are methods by which relevant existing systematic reviews can be evaluated for quality of methodological approach. Uh, one of them is uh, using AMSTAR, which is a checklist, and also Robbie's, um, the Robbie's statement, uh, which is uh, also to check the, the risk of bias or internal validity of systematic reviews. Um, so they can give us a uh, the, the sort of like the quality uh, measure for, for the, the previous systematic reviews. And then we have to determine appropriate use and incorporate existing systematic reviews. So the use of existing systematic reviews may include using the existing systematic reviews, listing of included studies as quality check for the literature search and screening strategy and um, also uh, using the existing systematic review to completely or partially provide the body of included studies for one or more key questions in the new review, and then using the data abstraction, risk of bias assessment, and or analysis from the previous uh, systematic reviews for one or more questions in the new review, or using the existing systematic reviews, um, including the conclusions to fully or partially answer one or more questions. So in each step, uh, we can determine if the information provided in the previous review is appropriate for the new review. And um, it's, it's important to comply with um, all this uh, process in, uh, that are outlined uh, by the guidelines, which is um, they are helping to minimize bias and also to help to summarize um, the qualitative and quantitative uh, methods or evidence uh, from um, previous reviews and incorporate them into new reviews and also to help to do the assessment of the evidence from the existing systematic reviews and grade that evidence as we have, as, as we learned with the uh, grade profiler. So, <clears throat> Now let's talk about um, risk of bias um, briefly. So we have a few minutes um, to check um, the criteria for quality of systematic review, which is um, one would be the Robbie's um, checklist and the AMSTER um, checklist. So let's 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 talk about AMSTER first. Uh, AMSTER is a checklist just to evaluate the quality of um, the systematic reviews, and this can be also used for um, peer review process. Um, not only to update previously um, systematic reviews or to do a review of systematic reviews, but also it can be used for a pre-review process. Um, as, as you can see, reporting and methodological quality are very linked, so you'll see some items that are similar to those that um, we have discussed from the PRISMA statement. But um, uh, these are more broad in scope. Um, the, the items included in AMSTER, um, so we will uh, have to uh, answer if the, the design uh, was provided a priori and if there was a duplicate study selection and data extraction. So when we are using one person, we have the risk to uh, compromise our study um, validity or systematic review validity. So, and you'll see uh, many of those items, and the Robbies would be exactly the same. Um, it's um, evaluating the risk of bias, uh, the study eligibility criteria, the identification and selection of studies, the data collection and synthesis and findings, and you can see the responses are different. Um, uh, we have responses as low risk, high risk, or unclear risk of bias if the information was reported or not in the 
in the systematic review. So these are the two tools that we can use uh, for reporting, uh, for evaluating the, I'm sorry, not reporting, evaluating the methodological quality of the systematic reviews. And, and they help in the, in the peer review process as well. So let's uh, go over the summary. So there are uh, two types of analytic methods in systematic reviews. Um, one is the narrative synthesis, uh, which we already explained that is the test description of individual study findings when we don't have um, uh, two, at least two studies evaluating the same outcome um, or the data uh, is very disp um, different or um, heterogeneous that we cannot combine apples and oranges. And then uh, we have the meta-analysis, which is the mathematical combination of individual study findings. And there are caveats to meta-analysis. Um, the studies have to be very similar to actually combine um, the data. And finally, and uh, this is the other key message that you have to take uh, away uh, out of this uh, webinar, is um, the reporting methods using the PRISMA statement. Remember that um, now most agencies are endorsing the PRISMA statement, and major um, journals or most journals um, are, are requiring the PRISMA checklist when you are submitting uh, systematic reviews. Um, there are some resources that you can um, go and check uh, the PRISMA statement would be one and then um, th they have the PRISMA checklist there. They have the full report with the explanation of each one of the items. And uh, also we have the flow chart in there. Um, the the Robbie's, uh, which includes um, the, it's the paper that describes the Robbie's statement. Uh, so we, you can um, evaluate the quality of the systematic reviews in case that you are interested uh, for peer review process or for doing a review of systematic reviews or updating a previous systematic review. And then for narrative synthesis, we have that paper of uh, methods for thematic synthesis of qualitative research in systematic reviews. And finally, the grade profiler to present the summary of findings tables. And that is it. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, include them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, it was a, a pleasure to give this talk. Okay, it seems like there are no questions. You can let us know if you have any questions. Uh, you can email us. I'm going to email you guys afterwards with the recording and the slides. Um, and be sure to I'll be sure to include these links that um, that Dr. Lopez talked about today. Thank you, guys. Thank you.